Okay, Glenn, I know that you've got views on you know, how we can use uh, digital solutions rather than physical solutions uh, in, in our management of transport. Tell me a bit more. Okay, so uh, where have we been? Traditionally, we've been in the business of, of building infrastructure, building roads, creating physical capacity to get people from A to B. That's what underpins economic prosperity and social well-being, uh, and, and that's about making a better society. But that's getting very expensive, mm -hmm. uh, and the demand is continuing to grow in different forms. But over the horizon, I think, has come the digital age. Uh, and so, yeah, as you suggest, it raises new opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Managed motorways. So managed motorways, uh, I've been doing, I'm dealing with managed motorways for quite some time now. Um, so this is a good example of um, using digital technology to squeeze more out of the physical asset that we had. I, th I think that's a good example um, because yes it does and it, isn't it fascinating that we had that spare lane on the side of our strategic road network which once was called the hard shoulder where you stopped if you uh, mm. uh, had run out of energy or run out of, uh, of fuel perhaps uh, and yet now we're making use of that as, as, a, as you suggest as a live running lane uh, and the technology has been essential to allowing us to do that but, but what do you think about the the issues that raises for mm, our network mm, utilisation. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, yes. So, uh, use the hard shoulder. Use the hard shoulder during normal operations. Relatively cheap to um, to get that extra one third in a three lane motorway through, but it takes away resilience. Um, that hard shoulder was used for other purposes. That hard shoulder could be used in the case of an incident. Now it's full of traffic. So you always got a problem of expanding capacity and uh, inducing further demand. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and, and we both know that uh, we learned a lesson in the 1990s that building more roads generates some new traffic. Mm, mm. Uh, and I have to say that for me, managed motorways uh, has some echo of that in that we're providing new capacity and surely that's gonna generate new demand. So where's that gonna take us? Yeah, well, of course, we could use technology as well or yeah, digital information as well to try and manage that. Um, I'm thinking of the information about, let's say, congestion hotspots that people will now be able to use to avoid that. But think of, of road pricing. I think uh, with, with current technology, uh, we know where people are at any point in time. So I think, as I understand it, every new transport minister gets told that the strap line is road pricing is about 10 years away. Uh, but I think perhaps for the first time in the 50 years we've talked about road pricing, it could seriously be a proposition now on the agenda because, mm -hmm. of course, um, slow though it may be in terms of uptake, the electrification of our vehicle fleet is starting to happen. So, do you, I mean, do you think that's uh, that's a key to alongside the managed motorways mm -hmm. to managing the demand for mm -hmm. use of our motorways? Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about the 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 electric vehicles and and uh, the whole issue of fuel duty reducing that might put electronic road pricing on the table. I was really thinking about you know, the GPS enabled uh, inf information that we can gather about uh, cars. I fully believe that uh, if we want to manage uh, future demand, we have to get into some kind of pricing and that people will be more open to that, the same way as they're open with many pricing aspects of using digital technology. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And without digital, we wouldn't be able to do that, or at least, to do it in a more sensitive way, because of course we've we've got road pricing uh, in the form of, of fuel duty, fuel tax at the moment, but it's a very blunt instrument. Uh, whereas digital allows us to better understand the individual units that are using our network. People are accepting yes, um, higher charges for Ubers in, uh, in in at peak times. I can understand that people will 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 accept that for normal use of roads as well, which actually gets me to the point of connected autonomous vehicles. Yeah, so we take this whole uh, discussion one step further. Um, so I think that CAVs will have to include some kind of pricing mechanism. The GPS en enables us to do it. ERP, electronic road pricing, is just part of that. And I think it, since you touch upon that subject, I think we'll come back to that. But um, autonomous vehicles, uh, it's interesting that uh, 2018, the UK Departments for Transport's first real attempt within its forecasting to at least ha have a look at what connected autonomous vehicles might mean for future utilisation of our road network. And it's clear that it's not 
plain good news uh, that we could be encouraging mm. what one mm. might say is less, less efficient use uh, of the road network, particularly in terms of vehicle occupancies. Uh, and I think yeah. vehicle occupancy has to be a critical mm -hmm. part, doesn't mm -hmm. it, of mm -hmm. the future? Yes, I think vehicle occupancy is surprisingly difficult to deal with. Uh, I was surprised again to see how low vehicle occup occupancies are or at the moment. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we could use digital technology to, to, to get that up a bit from the one and a half or whatever the number is at the moment? Um, and you wouldn't actually have to increase the capacity, the throughput capacity of vehicles very much if you could increase the vehicle, vehicle occupancy of, of, um, of the vehicles that are on the road. So Tom, I'm, yeah. I'm going to pass this over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're you're the modelling expert, but you're also aware of the the challenges that modelling faces in terms of scarce resource. It's it's a specialism, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it can be expensive. Do you think um, the age of big data? It, I mean, is data the new oil? Is it going to unlock new capabilities in terms of modelling our transport system? Yes, yes, big data. I think we're all very excited by it. Um, but it's got its challenges. I mean, let's pick up mobile phone data. I've been using mobile phone data mainly in, in, in terms of model support. And it's amazing how much um, information there is, of course, in mobile phone data. Uh, we can get people's movements from home to wherever they go by just tracing the, cell, the cells that they use. They will give us, as it were, their data for free because they can't use their phones without using the cells and, and the providers are happy to process it and provide it to us anonymously. And that was before the age of big data, an extremely expensive and slow and disruptive um, bit of information that we needed. But ju just to, to probe that a bit, so um, I appreciate we can trace people, the electronic trace tells us where they're going from and to, at least geographic locations. Yep, yep. But our lives are getting more and more complicated, it seems to me, in terms of what we're doing where we're in certain locations. So if I'm heading out and I'm dropping the children to school and then I'm going to work and on the way I pick up a click and collect shopping mm -hmm. order, mm -hmm. are, are, your, are your data gurus going to be able to make sense of that or is it just going to be a confusion of noise and signal? Well, yes, it's of course about um, horses for courses, what you try to do with this. So that example of yours is not a trip that we normally deal with in, in a modeling context. But for example, in a, in a real-time planning context, we could pick that up and I think we should be able to plan around it. What I find interesting about big data is that it gives us these insights in that you don't just go to work, you've got a much more complex life. And without big data, um, mobile phone derived data, we couldn't have picked it up. And people are very willing to share that data. I was, I was just thinking of, a, of a, a piece of work that Transport for London did recently where they looked at the free Wi-Fi that they provided in their stations <coughs> that people obviously link into. And they could work out not just the travel patterns of people on a normal day, but also what happened if there was disruption. This is not about modeling. This is not mm -hmm. about long-term forecasting. This is about immediate responses. That is the, the exciting thing. I suppose for me, it, it, again, we refer to big data in a, in a rather sort of overarching way. But when you start to get in, inside it, you realize that there are lots of different forms. So it strikes yep. me that... Um, we, we focus on the quantitative and I can see the value in that but there's also that qualitative dimension to social media feeds uh, and you mentioned yep. you know the transport systems operation and disruption uh, and we're seeing increasingly I think peer-to-peer -peer use of connectivity to, to share what you might call big data but it's not the same yeah, yeah, type yeah, of big yeah. data. Now the, other, the other point I want to make there is, is, is exactly what you say about this qualitative about understanding people's behavior I think big data, mobile phone data now allows us to start asking questions about what decisions do people really make rather than the paradigms that we've imposed on them because we didn't have much insight into the real complexity of people's decision making. So uh, and that also brings me to sort of that, that whole question around big data. Do we need to just throw a, an artificial intelligence algorithm at it and we all of a sudden learn all sorts of things that may or may not be real? Or do we continue to have behavioral researchers 
that say, I need to understand to be able to explain that behavior. Otherwise, it is just you know, noise in, 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 the, in the digital world. And that, what you're saying there provokes all sorts of thoughts in my mind. First of all, you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and of course, it, there's a sense at the moment that the, the, the Silicon Valley genre is able to tackle new questions with new capabilities mm. in ways that we haven't been able yeah. to resolve yeah. in the transport sector for decades. But I have a sneaky suspicion that um, those who are coming from outside the sector into transport are rather under, underestimating the complexity of the supply and demand that we, for many decades, have tried yeah. to get to grips yeah. with. Of course, do, we do, would say that, wouldn't we? We would, we would. This is what we've been doing for the last 25 years or more. But, but I think you're right. Transport and big data has, has enabled a whole new range of players into the field. Sometimes for good, because we've got a lot of new data, and just think of what the information that even Google Maps now provides you with. Uh, uh, virtually real time and for most users for free um, and, and and you know sticking to the old way of doing things is uh, would never have allowed us to do that um, on the other hand I, I fully agree with you that without insight this data is is probably not going to be, be very useful and potentially quite damaging to the kind of um, planning that we're trying to do. And I think, I mean, just to pursue AI a bit further, uh, my own suspicion is that, uh, like many things that are unfolding in this highly connected world, it is being hyped. Uh, I mean, I, I realised that 25 years ago I did my PhD in artificial intelligence and driver behaviour. Yeah. I, I actually was a model at all. Yeah, yeah, well, um, you uh, still could be. But I'm afraid the PhD, like many PhDs, didn't really make groundbreaking progress. Uh, and I do wonder whether you know we're, we're giving too much credence to the capability that AI currently has. So I suppose yeah, yeah. it leads us to the question: you know, where do you think big data might be taking us if we went forward five years or ten years? Do, do you think it really is a, a new panacea of opportunity? I'm not so sure, and I think we'll pick that up next time when we when we're having a coffee. Glenn, I um, read over the weekend that they've now started running a um, autonomous taxi in Dubai. Uh, I know you've got quite a big interest in autonomous vehicles. What do you think about oh, about that? Oh, you know, there's a risk if you get me started, <coughs> I, I won't stop I know, Tom I on this subject. Um, yeah, I think that uh, stories like this are emerging, of course, and in a way that we couldn't have imagined uh, probably five years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the real challenge is how do we get under the skin of them to understand the, the degree of capability that they're demonstrating. Uh, so we've seen around the world, in the UK, US, uh, and as Dubai, as you mentioned, Australia as well, um, attempts to trial autonomous vehicles or driverless yeah, cars yeah, yeah. Uh, or driverless shuttles. Um, some interesting uh, outcomes. Sometimes they, they seem very impressive, but other times you realize that they're on a, a private airfield uh, or the, uh, the inflatable kangaroo gets run over in Australia. I it saw did, I in did, a, yes. a recent video clip. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's that challenge of how we filter what we're being told about the progress that's being made and, this is and, and what's really happening. Yeah, it's also, of course, these are all autonomous vehicles, but the idea is to have connected autonomous vehicles. And although I presume they're connected to the roadside in, in one way or another, otherwise they couldn't be self-driving, the whole connectivity with other vehicles, which is one of the advantages, uh, particularly from a safety perspective, we haven't seen yet. <coughs> yeah, I think there's a there seems to be a natural conflation of connected and autonomous. And in one sense, one imagines when we reach that stage where you've got fully driverless cars, the steering wheel disappears, yeah, then yeah. surely the technology for vehicles to talk to one another will be already in place. So they will be connected and autonomous. And yet there are debates going on in the technology circles around whether these vehicles should be connected, which creates an interdependence, yeah, or yeah, whether they yeah. should be independently scanning the infrastructure they're moving through so that you won't have things like cyber attack and, and issues of, of yeah, resilience yeah, and vulnerability. Good point, good point. But will people actually want it? I mean, that's still my my concern. Well, not concern, you know, it's, but people, people seem to be interested, but will they use it? And, and when will they use it? And how will they use it? Yeah, all, all good questions. And I, and I think uh, there is a, an uncomfortable position around, is this a solution looking for a problem. Now, yeah. 
it's certainly true we're told you know we could have um, vision zero no more road fatalities mm -hmm, or even mm -hmm. uh, serious injuries from mm -hmm, vehicles mm -hmm. uh, that clearly is a prize uh, worth trying That's to secure but at, at, what, at what cost in, in other respects um, and also yes is there a public appetite uh, to take these vehicles up over time. And, 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 and then also, not just the public appetite, or how we are going to own them and how we're going to use them. Because as far as I can see, shared ownership, and, and, and on top of that, shared use, is what really is going to offer us the benefits of, of self-driving cars. Uh, absolutely, but if we, we look at what we know to date, sharing is not something that features strongly in our mobility <laughs> system. Uh, you might say, well, people share on a bus. Yes, of course they do. Uh, friends and family share journeys uh, mm -hmm. in their own networks. But predominantly, we look out there and we see our highway networks filled with individual occupants of vehicles because it's convenient. And sharing introduces a degree of inconvenience. You have to accommodate other people's uh, timings and origins and destinations. Nation. So unless yeah. it's going to be expensive not to share, yeah, yeah. What, what's the incentive? Well, the incentive must be economic, a, a re reduction in cost. And I hope that the technologies that we're seeing now, the platforms that are already available, that sharing won't be as hard as, as, as people perceive it now. I'm, I'm, I agree with you that we don't see a huge uptake in sharing in the, the existing um, mobility platforms such as uh, public transport or even Ubers um, and will that change over time and, and is that a behavioural change that we can influence with technology? So what, what really worries me Tom is that um, we are making some, not you and I perhaps, but the sector is making some convenient assumptions about sharing being yeah. a part of this future mm. and that is helping to, to, to seduce the sector, our policy makers, the investment into pursuing this dream of yep. automation because it's going to make the transport system safe, efficient, yep. available for all. Yep. What could be better? It's utopia. Um, but let's rewind and ask ourselves, you know, when, when the automobile arrived, for all the good things it's brought, we know now how many unintended consequences and challenges and problems it's created. Yep, yep. It's redefined the very landscape of, of society yep. and the way we live, live our lives in ways we couldn't have imagined. And I can't help yep, thinking, yep. be careful what you wish for. Yes, but have we got any control? That, that, that is, of course, the question. Maybe we should take more control and, and be less led by the, the technology nerds or by the, the, the companies that have got a real vested interest in, in vehicle sales rather than the planners or the asset owners, such as you know, the cities and the, and the highway authorities. Yeah, and I, and I think that's right, that the, the our public authorities really have a golden opportunity uh, to take more ownership mm. over shaping <coughs> our future. They should. But le let's face it, they're in difficult times with the, the pressure for economic recovery uh, and the huge seductive opportunities yep. for, for growing yep. new jobs and making lots of yep. money. So Glenn, as a modeler, I'm absolutely fascinated by mobility as a service. It really causes me problems in terms of trying to forecast the future and incorporate mobility as a service into my models. What do you think? How can I do that better? Well, I guess the first thing, uh, and as a modeler, you know how important being able to define things uh, is. So mm. we, we should probably just clarify between ourselves what we're talking about with mobility as a service. So, you know, as I understand it, it's really saying, once we go beyond the private car, how can we have convenient access to what the rest of the transport system and all the different modes involved has to offer? And that's using a, a digital platform yep. where we may have a subscription, uh, which means we, we have unlimited access to the, the modes available from, from hire cars to ride hailing to uh, shared cycles. Is that, yep. Does that sum yep. up what you see it being? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But the, uh, the interesting thing about mobility as a service to me that to some extent it already exists in what we have available as a, as a population but we don't seem to be using it in that way so the question to me is will people change their behavior their, their, their consumption of transport services once you got a sort of mobility as a service app or a mobility as a service service available to you yeah. Yeah, and, I, and, that, and that's the question that's the heart of this, I think. And, of course, the, the proponents of mobility as a service, which 
we both know is is not really a brand new concept. I, I think it's no. old wine in yeah. new bottles. Yeah. We've we've been working for decades to get information layers helping support um, decision making that people make in the transport system. So in that sense, it's not new, but it does suggest we might have even greater convenience. And the question is, is it just convenience that's holding people back from changing their behaviour and leaving their private car at home? I think the information aspect is important because one of the attractions I think of mobility as a service will be to be able to respond in real time to changing conditions on the network. So what was a good choice when you started your journey is no longer a good choice by the time you get to halfway through your journey. And this is why it makes it so difficult for me to try and model mobility as a service with the traditional modeling tools that we got. And, and, and also of course what we see is uh, a, a different attitude of, of, of the younger generation. So this is an emerging sort of understanding and, and how is it going to pan out over time? Are, are, is this a real fundamental change or is this sort of a temporary sort of uh, adjustment? I, I think it, it has the prospect of being a fundamental change but if we look at you know an, a new word in our dictionaries, Uberization, mm. um, in some cities around the world now particularly for certain demographics it seems second nature that you will just Uber and, and get yeah. from A to B incredibly conveniently and that's one element of mobility as a service. But, okay, take that Uberization of yours. Uberization could be just as I get a, um, I get access to a, a bike, a shared bike, a Boris bike rather than an Uber. What people want to buy, I think, is that service, that mobility as a service, i.e. I want to go from A to B and at the moment all they can buy through the platform is an Uber but if they can buy through a platform an Uber or a bike or whatever else might be available, um, that would be mobility as a service, wouldn't it? But I, th I, yeah, and I think the risk is we go full circle. So um, go back several decades. Why would you buy a car? Because for you personally, it gives you untold freedom that you didn't have before mm -hmm. to get from A to B conveniently. The only problem is everyone else went and got a car and made your life really difficult. And I think where we're going with mobility as a service, if we're not careful, uh, is that we're going to find that the most convenient modes yep. are the hailed taxi ride yeah, yeah. or the yeah. car hire, which are being offered as part of these packages. Yeah, sure. And what's being neglected uh, is mass transit, is, is the bus, um, coach and rail perhaps even, uh, and also yeah. walking yeah. and cycling. Yeah. I, on the other hand, we're seeing you know real dynamics in travel behaviour. Who'd have thought our cities would have so many docked and dockless cycles which people are trying and experimenting yeah. with and embracing yeah. already? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's, that, that's a fair point. And the, the, the challenge is for us as planners to try and find ways in which mobility as a service could be used to create a better mobility environment, looking also at the societal, societal benefits rather than just allowing people to make their individual self-optimizing choices as you were referring to. And that is a problem that we've of course faced for many, many years. Yeah, and, and I, absolutely. So we've got, we've got individuals who are often behaving, you might say, selfishly, but let's not forget those mobility operators that are pr the proponents of mobility as a service yeah. have shareholders and venture yeah. capitalists <laughs> yeah. behind them. Money matters yeah. uh, and mobility is a form of consumption. We they want more rather than less, but we as planners want yeah. less rather than more. In, in the end, it's all about the money again, isn't it? It's all about the money, Tom.